All right. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, I'm delighted to have this series uh, with Angela uh, on polymaths. Today, he, she, you know, the, the topic is going to be the ethos of polymaths and her guest is Michael Ferguson. Take it away, Angela. All right, yeah, hi everybody. Like Shrikant said, my name is Dr. Angela Cotalesa. For those of you who are not familiar with who I am, um, just a quick summary is that I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the lived experiences of modern day polymaths. Actually, I thought I'll show it here. You guys can see it. Um, it's available for free digitally, by the way, on ResearchGate, or you can buy it in hard copy on Amazon if you live in the United States. Um, so the topic, as Srikant said, we're going to be talking about the ethos of a, a polymath, kind of the characteristic spirit, the kind of personality, the values that they tend to hold. And what's interesting about it, just right off the bat, is that polymaths are multidisciplinary thinkers and, and professionals in a world that prizes specialization. So right off the bat, you could probably guess that they're a little bit rebellious and brave, but um, so that's what the topic is. Before we dive in, I also wanna give a definition for anybody who is not familiar. So what is a polymath? I'm gonna give you Rob, Dr. Robert Root Bernstein's definition. I consider him the forefather of polymath studies in academia. His definition is active engagement in multiple interests or endeavors, integrating vocations with avocations, so your profession with your hobbies, simultaneously or serious, serially across the lifespan. So there's a lot going on there in that definition. I also wanna say a few other things before we dive in. One, this is a highly understudied area of uh, you know, research in academia. And in my view, polymathy exists on a spectrum and a range. So it's not a question of, am I a polymath or am I not a polymath? It's more how polymathic is someone. And, and you know, it involves breadth, of course, a breadth of expertise and knowledge, as well as depth. It's being more than a dabbler. Um, so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Now I wanna, I wanna introduce you guys to Michael Ferguson, who I first discovered when I was doing my research. I was Googling about polymathy in addition to looking in the ac academic literature. And I found that Michael Ferguson was a real thinker and writer in this area. And he's been at it a long time. So Michael, I wanna hand it over to you. And could you just take a few minutes to tell people about your background and also just when, when and why and how have you been involved in promoting polymathy over the years? Okay, uh, to start out, um, I guess my <clears throat> approach to knowledge has been the way it is since I was maybe three. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if we lost audio. Darn, that didn't last long. <laughs> well, I'm going to just, uh, just give me a second. I'm going to, uh, let's go ahead and text and let him know, can't hear you. Okay, he's not in the meeting. So he'll be coming back shortly. Okay. So okay. folks, um, what we are doing is that this is a series um, where Ang Angela is going to interview a whole bunch of people um, who are polymaths. And um, so Angela, tell me a little bit about your vision for this series. It's a 10 part series. What, mm -hmm. what is the range of what you'll be doing? Yeah, so actually let me pull up my, my list. Um, so today where we're gonna be talking, or we will be talking about the ethos, the values that polymaths tend to hold. Uh, two weeks from today, we we're gonna talk about polymaths and organizations, which is a real challenge actually, because organizations tend to value specialists and they tend to discriminate against polymath. So we're gonna be talking about like, what can you do if you exist in an organization? And by the way, I'm writing a book on this right now. So my co-author of that book will be attending. Um, then on December 27th, we're gonna be talking about modern tech. And, and I think I may add the future of work and how, how polymaths can leverage that, you know, their polymathy in the future of work as tech kind of advances more and more. On January 10th, we're going to be talking about the power of polymathy. They have a lot of strengths, but, but how can we sort of harness and, and integrate polymaths with specialists to really push humanities forward? 
January 24th, we're going to be talking about the paradoxes of polymathy, because that's one of the things I found in my research is that it's kind of like being a living contradiction. Like when you're this calm, it, it's not necessarily a contradiction. It just feels like you're an unexpected combination of things that people don't expect. And there are some paradoxes involved with that. On February 7th, we're going to talk about intrapersonal diversity, which is another way I sort of think of polymathy. It's having diversity within yourself. Um, so we're going to talk about that on February 7th. February 21st, I'm going to attempt to get the leading thinkers in academia together in one virtual room and just see what happens with them. And then the last session, number 10 on March 7th, will be talking about polymaths and life mastery, because that's what I heard from so many of the polymaths I interviewed is that at the end of the day, they, they use their polymathy. One of the reasons they pursue polymathy is to be the best version of themselves that they can be through learning and experiencing, you know, the fullness of life. So those are the 10 sessions, my plan. Um, I will say too, as long as we're kind of killing some time till hopefully Michael Ferguson gets back, let me give an overview of how, how I think the day will go, assuming Michael Ferguson is able to participate. So the plan would be until about 3.15 to have a discussion with Michael. And if Michael can't make it, I may end up interviewing Srikant because he's a polymathic kind of guy. And then after that, we'll take some Q&A and then breakout rooms for about 20 minutes. And then each participant will have an opportunity to share your takeaways from the discussion. And if, you know, we'll do the best we can with these technical challenges, having a guest coming from Albania with some shoddy internet and storms, I apologize for this. <laughs> That's fine. So let's, let's go, let's start with the interview. So, okay. so yeah, I, I'll give you two choices. I can interview you or you can interview me. What would you prefer? You know, I'll interview. I kind of like the idea of interviewing you, Shrikant. Okay, because, go for it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I will be speaking to, like, I've prepared some material in addition to, you know, some questions I can ask. And we can even maybe my, my open it up. My is that I'm very interested in hearing Michael Ferguson. So if Michael yeah. comes, we will interrupt my interview. We'll go to Michael's interview. When we lose him again, we'll continue with my interview. Yeah. Okay? Sounds good. Thank yeah. you, everybody, for your flexibility uh, as we adjust. Okay. So... I've identified and sort of written out eight values or, or sets of values that I heard from the polymaths I interviewed. And by the way, yes, I did interview and study modern day polymaths. And the first thing I want to say that they value, which is probably fairly obvious, is that a polymathic person values learning. The word polymath means many learning. So if you're a polymathic person, obviously you value information, intelligence, you're curious, you want to grow what you know rather than shrink it. Um, and so polymaths are learners. That's what they are. And they're good at learning. Actually, if there was a single thing I would say is the essence and the kind of real superpower of polymaths is that they're good learners. And that's actually quite valuable. Not everybody is, you know, there's a, a range of how good someone is at learning and remembering information. They have not just an appreciation for learning, but a real voracious appetite for it. Um, one of the participants I interviewed said, I called him Levi, all of them had pseudonyms, but Levi said, I'm happiest when I'm learning something. I've realized that about myself, so that's a big part of it. And I think that's why I've accrued this bizarre skill set. Someone else called Felicity said, if it's just me, I feel like I'm always thinking. I'm wondering if any of you identify with that. I feel like I'm always thinking. My brain never turns off. Curiosity drives my life personally. Curiosity about any particular subject. And I guess that that would be how I define myself as a polymath is that I'm endlessly curious about science or art or whatever. And I'm going to find something and dig into it. He, and Levi also said, I love seeing the layers in things. I love to learn about the layers to know the world in very different ways. So I think Michael Ferguson just popped back in. Yes, give me just a second. I'm going to make him a co-host so he can unmute and speak. So if he comes back, I'm gonna ask him to tell us about himself and then I'm gonna ask him a question that has to do with information and learning and because he's Michael, really- Michael, can you hear us? I can hear you. Wonderful. I'm trying to download on my smartphone because it's better internet connection. Excellent. But that's taking some time. Okay. Uh, so the storms are just making a mess out of, out of the internet. 
So Michael, could you go back? We didn't hear much about your background. Just tell us a little bit about you, who you are and your background and what brought you to polymathy and how you've been involved in promoting it over the years. Well, um, I've, I've had a career, but it's got uh, really not much to do with anything other than it got me money. Uh, as I said, starting at about the age of three, I started aggressively attacking uh, human knowledge. And, uh, and I didn't do it with any kind of uh, subject to focus at all. Uh, a, a good example is at one point in time, I asked myself the question of um, why are there barbers? Uh, all animals, uh, their hair stops growing when it gets to the right length for them, whatever uh, uh, evolution said it would be. But if that's the case, humans' hair tends to grow down somewhere around their uh, thighs. Uh, and the question is, what is the adaptive advantage of that? I mean, now we cut it all off and we shape it and all that kind of stuff. But evolution said our, that's how long our hair is supposed to be. Why? Now, that is not a question that's really related to a subject. That was related to statistics, molecular biology, evolutionary biology, just a whole lot of things. And I just wandered around without any regard of what subject I wandered into. It was just an interesting question. That is an interesting question. And Michael, can you tell us, you know, you're obviously very involved in promoting polymathy with Facebook and your blog. And, um, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about how long you've been sort of trying to bring attention to this and in what in what areas, what organizations, what platforms have you been doing that? Well, I think when I was about 15 years old, I decided that I wanted this, uh, my career would be in a company I started called Universal Research. So I think uh, this, this was just how I was from the beginning. Uh, I, as I said uh, before to you, um, Probably sometime around 1980, I started to attack the issue with the local Mensa group. Mm -hmm. And then AOL came out and I went there. Uh, and then Facebook and Yahoo groups came out and I went to those places. So I've been trying to promote the idea, but the fact is I've, I've always thought of myself as being a bit of a flawed vessel that I'm much better at doing it than I am at promoting it. Mm. Well, I'm very grateful to have you in the field promoting it because there haven't been a whole lot of us doing that. <laughs> All right. So, Michael, while you were gone, I, I you know, I, I explained to the group that I'm, we're going to be talking roughly about eight different values that polymaths tend to prize and, and that inform how they live their life and the sort of ethos around their, their existence. And so the first one probably makes sense to put it first, right, is that they value learning. They value information. Uh, intelligence. They're very curious. So just having information is something that is very important to polymathic people. And it tends to show up in like people kind of overthinking or always thinking or just always sort of having this incessant hunger for more information. I know you call it um, compulsive learning disorder, right, my Michael? Yes. <laughs> yes. I That's love that. That's what I have anyway. <laughs> compulsive learning disorder. My, so my wife comments says that, yeah, I'm I'm walking down the sidewalk and there's a piece of paper laying on the sidewalk. I absolutely must pick it up to see what's on the other side. Why? Uh, it's, it's just a personality trait. Compulsive learning disorder. So Michael, I know you've looked at IQ quite a bit. So I'm curious, you know, do you think there is any connection between polymathy and IQ? Well, um, I would uh, suggest to everybody the research that's being done uh, was done by Robert Hauser at the University of Wisconsin, where he really looked at the char characteristic IQs of various professions. And what we find is it is a characteristic IQ. In other words, if you're a physician, you want to be a physician, the mean IQ for physicians is 126, standard deviation is about 67 which means virtually everybody uh, who's a physician has an IQ between 106 and, and uh, say 146. Um, and um, there's reasons for that. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you're a janitor, you're gonna have a characteristic IQ, but it's gonna be a different range. So it would be extremely unusual uh, if we get to the point where we have formalized the notion of a polymath as a profession that there wouldn't be a, a characteristic IQ for it. 
Okay. Do you think there's like a cutoff somebody has to have to consider themselves a polymathic person? Or do you think well, there's kind of like a range where- I, I, think you, I think you know that I started two organizations, one's Polymathic or the other one's the Polymathic Institute. Mm -hmm. And the reason was specifically that anybody can be curious. And right. that's what polymathic is about. You're just, you're just generally curious. I'm generally interested, not generally not interested. But the Polymathic Institute was supposed to be there for people who wanted to pursue polymathy as a career. Yeah. So there's a I, difference there. I love that. Anybody can be curious. All right. So, so again, information and learning, curiosity, like that is a real value that polymaths have. Let's move on to number two. Uh, this is what I heard from the people or observed in the people that I interviewed as part of my research is there's a real openness to experience a kind of open mindedness, obviously learning to learn something you do kind of have to op literally open your mind, combined with this sort of critical, uh, independent way of thinking about themselves and their lives and just about information more generally. So here I'm going to share a few sample quotes um, that touch on these. And these are from the people I interviewed. Hunter said, I find myself getting much more quickly frustrated in situations with people who are extremely narrowly educated. He said, the narrowness of experience, there's, there's the narrowness of experience, and then there's being narrow-minded. And there's not a perfect overlap, but there is some of that Venn diagram there. And I think it's generally super unhelpful. So what he was trying to get at is, you know, that being open-minded it does tend or being open to experience does tend to make you broader minded. Does Michael, does that um, does that resonate with you? Yes, absolutely. I guess if you're going to take the attitude that you are attacking the uh, aggregate uh, body of human knowledge, you can't do that if you aren't open to things. Yeah, uh, it, it's just it's just part of the lifestyle. Yeah. And by the way, openness to experience, everybody, it's been studied a lot. Like it's it's mm -hmm. one of the big five personality traits and they can be measured and it's been written about and studied a lot. And so I just want to really underscore that polymaths value this openness to experience. And that's why they have, you know, such broad variety of experiences. Another quote, um, Levi said, there's just something about learning that just I enjoy sitting there and it's like, this is new. I did not know this. How could this possibly be? And there's just something absolutely appealing to collecting new knowledge. I love that he said collecting. I guess to a point, I do enjoy challenging myself, seeing how far I can go, but that's definitely not the be all end all of why I like learning. I'm just happy to learn something new. There's something definitely exciting about it. No matter what it is, I'm happy to learn it. I see a lot of people seem to be afraid. This is interesting. A lot of people seem to be afraid of new knowledge when their worldview gets changed or challenged. You see that all the time now. So even if it hurts my worldview, it's like, oh, oh, there's a fact there. Okay, sure, I'll have to adjust and I'm happy to. So that was, I thought, such an interesting quote is that this person was so open-minded and so interested in facts and information that they were willing to adjust their worldviews if something was inconsistent with, you know, the facts and, and how they thought the, the world is. Michael Ferguson, do you have any observations or thoughts on that? A lot of them. So with Ben Shapiro, uh, reality doesn't care about your feelings. Um, you know, I remember when I was very long, young, learning about the adaptive benefit of, um, uh, of uh, sickle cell anemia. And that was like one of the first places where I looked at that and said, I don't want to be living in a reality that is that harsh, that cruel, uh, but I do. So it doesn't, most people face a whole bunch of sort of revelatory experiences like that, where they make the decision of whether you're going to accept uh, the uncomfortable fact, or if you're going to start trying to modify your worldview to make it go away. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and polymaths can't do that because they're going to run into uh, cognitive dissonance all the time. Yeah. Because everything's connected. Yes, everything's connected. That was a, a good quote by Leonardo da Vinci. He said, learn to see the, the science of art and the art of science and that it's all connected. Okay, one other quote in this uh, section from Trinity. She said, I really think critical thinking 
goes hand in hand with being polymathic, making connections across different parts of the brain. Michael, do you think there's a connection between um, polymathy and critical thinking or the ability to do effective critical thinking? <laughs> well, uh, she actually said two things, uh, but taking the one that's more uh, on point, uh, if you're not a critical thinker, you're going to be a crappy polymath. Uh, you sort of need to uh, be willing to challenge knowledge. You need to be able to challenge the way the conventional wisdom is pointing you. Um, on the other hand, what she said about connecting through different parts of your brain, there's a notion of, uh, that Paul Kuzman was a guy who, who looked into this a lot. Says, there's this idea that, uh, that um, polymaths, or he calls them geniuses, but I think it means the same thing, um, are capable of grabbing data that is very conceptually remote from the piece that you're looking at and bring it in. Um, you know, I, I think uh, uh, Walter Alvarez, if you're familiar with his work on uh, the extinction, uh, KT extinction, he did that where he connected, he connected uh, 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 excess uh, um, metals in, in the KT boundary and said, huh, that may mean that there was an asteroidal strike that killed all the uh, uh, dinosaurs. He was grabbing something that was conceptually very far away from what he was working on. And I think that that's naturally polymaths have to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm curious for you, Michael, you, you are clearly a very strong polymath. And I'm curious how your broad learning and your broad exposure over the course of your whole lifetime helps you think more critically. Um, I don't, I don't, don't know that I've got a strong answer for that. You know, to an extent, my polymathy is not particularly something that is, uh, deeply self-inspected. Uh, like I said, I, I'm, I'm captured by a question or a problem. Uh, and, and then I just sort of like dive into it and start getting stuff from all over the place. And I don't really spend a lot of time figuring out how I do it. I'm having too much fun doing it. Mm-hmm. Seems like you ask good questions too, like that thing about the, the length of the human hair. I mean, I think that's part of being a good critical thinker too, is just knowing what question, you know, some interesting questions to ask. You know, there was a, there was a first uh, year uh, math teacher at the University of Chicago, and she taught more future mobilists, noblest than anybody else that we know of. And when she was asked, what is the difference between the Nobel Prize winners and the ones that weren't? Did you see any difference in undergraduates? She said, yes. Uh, they had an uncanny ability to recognize a theoretically interesting question. Mm, if you point. do that, there's a whole lot of people who can answer the question. Right. I love that. All right. Let's move on to value number three that polymaths cherish. And this one is kind of being independent, original, having freedom. That came up with a number of my interviews and, and being an autonomous person, the really paving your own way. And this is obviously very relevant because polymaths, multidisciplinary experts professionally are going against the grain, you know, in a, a world that cherishes specialization. We live in an age of specialization. The dominant ideology says, if you want to be successful, then specialize and specialize deeply, uh, pick your niche and stick with it. So obviously people who don't do that are being, uh, you know, very independent and original, original, doing something a different way. Um, and another reason is, is because nobody tells a polymath, okay, I want you to study zoology and geography and have a field in a, uh, a professional experience in accounting and IT, like nobody tells you your combination, right? So that involves some autonomy to, to decide that for yourself, because they're not going to be told to do that uh, by someone else. So, so polymaths become these unique combinations of knowledge and experiences. They're real originals. Um, one quote I'll share from, from someone who I called Carl. He spoke about being financially at the mercy of his interests at any given time. And that what money represented to him was freedom. He said, quote, obviously just as my interests change, also my finances change. That's the one thing I noticed. Financial freedom is very important. The more financial freedom I have, the more creative I am and the happier I am, even though money is never the main goal. I would never say, oh, I have to take this job because I can buy me a car. It only buys me freedom, 
So then I can say, now I don't have to do this for, I, I can do whatever I want for the next six months. I buy me freedom. I don't buy me things. I thought that was really interesting. Um, Michael Ferguson, do you have any, any thoughts on that about sort of the connection between the finances and, and freedom as a polymath? Uh, a whole bunch. Uh, there's a reason why I have pressed on Polymathic Institute so much and saying, look, we got to figure out a way to certify polymaths. We got to find a way to, to make easy paths to a polymathic job career because uh, none of that exists right now. For the most part, polymaths are faced with a very difficult decision early in life. Uh, am I going to go and uh, get married, uh, have kids, buy a house, do all that? If that's the case, then I'm going to have to make a commitment to a certain income level, which often means that you're making sacrifices. On the other hand, if you decide not to do that, and I have known polymaths that don't, you sort of just wander around uh, on the margins financially, but you have the freedom to go ahead and, and explore whatever it is you want to explore. I mean, I got, I got one friend who's a polymath. He's 47 years old. He still lives with his parents. Why? Because it gives him freedom. Uh, for me, I wanted marriage, kids, house, all that kind of stuff. So I had to, I had to accept that I needed to take on a professional level job. And I did. Um, I'm so happy now that I don't need to do that. Yeah, so interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Michael. Here's another quote that has to do with uh, freedom at work. Diana said, the employers who understand that putting me on multiple projects and unleashing my creativity and giving me autonomy have seen fantastic results. The ones who look at somebody like me and are like, I don't even know what box to put you in. And then they try to force me into a box. It's been miserable for everybody. The best way to set me up for success is to give me a goal and get out of the way. And that doesn't mean I'm not going to include people or I'm not going to respond to feedback, but it's don't micromanage me. I think the biggest way to douse the fire of a polymath is to micromanage them. The way you succeed is you give them a goal and you give them guardrails and you check in on a regular basis, but you don't get in her way, end quote. Michael, do you have any thoughts on that about how important it is to, to let polymaths have some level of freedom even in the workplace? Well, first I say that what she's talking about is more a characteristic of a very high IQ person than it is of somebody who's necessarily polymathic. You can be very much oriented toward a specialist, but still if you are like at a different level of expertise and ability than the people around you, that's what the wise manager does is just simply say, go do your thing. Um, now, at one point in my career, I was about 33 years old and it lasted about four years. I had the opportunity to be sort of the special counselor to the CEO of a large energy company, where basically that's what he was using me for. He's saying, okay, you get to see, you see the whole picture. So I'm going to ask you to sort of counsel me. I, said, I'm, I feel like I'm Merlin to your, uh, to your King Arthur. You're the leader. I'm the, I'm, I'm the guy uh, who knows what to do. Uh, and I did that for four years and it was wonderful, but then... They sold the company, he cashed out, and it's like, that was a one-time deal. I think that that's something that companies could do with polymaths uh, that would be productive. Okay. And Michael, you've known so many polymaths over the years as someone who sort of, I've heard you say you collect polymaths um, in, your, in your groups. And I'm curious how you have seen polymathic people express their independence, originality, freedom, or autonomy. And like, are there any standout examples you can share of someone who was a real original in their polymathy? Well, mostly when you go around collecting polymaths, what you're collecting are very frustrated people who have like a disorganized life. In other words, it's not working for them. Uh, you're, you're very, I mean, it's like Peter Diamandis, I guess mm -hmm. what you'd look at him and say, uh, he's kind of polymathic. Mm -hmm. um, and he's obviously made a success out of doing that. We have a lot of arguments, but 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 that's normal for uh, people who are looking at hard problems. Um, as far as somebody who's, I have a friend, Garth Zeitzman, who uh, got one of the highest IQ scores ever. And he and I share something in common. And we did for a very long time, is we set a goal upon ourselves that we, we would read one college text or graduate level text a week, 50 a year. Uh, and that's just, that, that's what we both did. Obviously that made us very knowledgeable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
and he had he obviously had the intellect to do it. Wow, that's amazing. That's a lot of reading. But he was a he was a statistician at a bank. It, it didn't really relate to his career. Hmm. Well, that's very polymathic to pursue information, even if it's not related to your day job. <laughs> All right, let's move on to number four. Another key value that polymaths cherish is variety, change, and newness. Um, so one of the people I interviewed, Carl, said that kind of idea that you would do the same stuff for the rest of your life is horrifying. The idea that you might have a job for life, or if you do this, then you will continue to do this, that never worked for me. Give me freedom, give me interesting challenges. Michael Ferguson, do you have any thoughts on that quote or just in general, the importance of variety, change and newness in the life of a polymath? Kind of kind of a story of my life. Uh, up until the time I was 40, I climbed the uh, corporate ladder. I did that, as I said, because I wanted uh, wife, children, uh, house, all that kind of stuff. And so you kept trying to get more and more money so that you'd be able to do that. And then when I was about 40, I had the opportunity to take on a very challenging uh, consulting position while I was between jobs. And I just absolutely loved it. It took me about four months and uh, I had everything straightened out and I said, fine, and all that. And I said, you know, that's my life because here when I'm doing the consulting kind of stuff like that, uh, just about the time I'm gonna get bored with it, I'm gone. Uh, so yes, I absolutely relate to it. Uh, boredom in uh, jobs are, is just a huge problem for polymaths. Absolutely. Um, one thing I want to say too, it, from a, a participant who was called Sarah, I just felt this pit in my stomach. Like, is this it? Am I going to be doing this forever? Like just this, but only doing that forever because in order to be to really make any money at it or to be at the level I was interested in being at, you just have to completely uh, be completely singularly focused. Um, Carl also said, anything that's a repetitive task, I really don't like. So obviously you could see in some of these quotes and also from what, what Michael shared is that, you know, jobs that are routine and uh, stable and, and repetitive would not be a good match for polymath because they value variety, newness, and change. Um, and Michael, one other question on this one is, as part of your own polymathic journey, you are a digital nomad. You are calling in today from Albania. Can you tell us about how any preferences you personally have for variety, change, and newness have played into your decision to be a digital nomad? Well, I am a digital nomad primarily because I don't know where I want to live. Um, <laughs> so I'm traveling all over the place trying to find, I, I want to have, I want to follow summer. So I want to have a, 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 a tropical place in the winter. I want to have a more temperate place in the summer, maybe have a third place just to get some variety. But it is not my goal to, um, as it is for some poly, uh, uh, digital nomads to just wander around through the rest of my life, but rather I'm trying to find that that life that uh, gives me uh, a certain amount of variety, but also gives me a certain amount of stability. So mostly it's an episodic thing. Okay, interesting. All right, let's go to number five, innovation and creativity. Um, polymaths, I would say that this is another one of their superpowers in addition to just being good at learning by nature because they have a lot of tools in their toolkit and they've had exposure to multiple domains. What can happen is they can make combinations, they can do analogical thinking, they, they can apply lessons and approaches from one domain to another. And in the meantime, innovation and creativity happen. So here's a quote um, again from Carl. He said, for me, creativity is the whole point of recombining existing concepts, taking existing knowledge, but finding a new combination between them. Creativity is not really about creating something new from scratch because that isn't possible, he says. You can only work from what you know. In a way, that's my core thing. You cannot imagine something absolutely that you have never seen. You can only recombine or extrapolate a little bit. That's why I think having a, no a knowledge of as many different concepts, ideas, things in your head is the best base of actually creating something new. Because if you just know things about one field, you can only play with these Lego bricks in a way. 
having different colored ones from a different field or differently assembled ones allows you to create something different, new in that field. You take something from the other field, a structure, and apply it to this field. In this field, it's new, even though the way it's being stacked together has already been done somewhere else. For me, it's the essence to be creative, to have these multiple interests and be widely interested in everything. Looking outside your field and trying to see patterns that can be applied to something else, it works. I always think that you do not find these in interesting inspirations for something you're doing in your own field. It pretty much has been explored already. You have to look outside. To create art, I look at, pretty, uh, at mathematics. I look in bi biology. I look in whatever to find some inspiration. In general, the theme in my career is somehow creative being creative. Michael, uh, some might argue that creativity and innovation are more important now than ever, given how difficult the changes we're experiencing in the human race in 2020. I'm curious, both if you have any comments on Carl's quote about sort of combining things, but also, you know, because innovation and creativity are so important, what what is your wish for how polymathy can be more appreciated and expanded more in the future? Well, um, what Carl was saying uh, mostly relates to what I would call a research polymath, somebody who's looking for new knowledge. And there's two things that a polymath can do that other people in the fields cannot do. One is they can borrow an epistemological approach from a different subject with which they're familiar and apply it uh, to a, a new, new subject. Um, I do that a lot. Uh, it's sort of something I needed to do in order to solve the wire their barbers problem. Um, the other thing that they, they do is that they grab facts, uh, what I call conceptually uh, remote facts, and said, you know what, these two things are related. One sitting over here in, uh, say, human geography, and this other one sitting over here in, in urban planning, but I see that they're connected, and when I put them together, I come up with a third realization, something new. So that's what I think about when they talk about creativity. The old creativity of uh, how many uses can you think of for a brick? That has proven to be sort of a dead end uh, in psychometry. Mm -hmm. And given, well, actually, let me back up. I think there is one of the reasons to promote polymathy and why I'm passionate about it is because I think in addition to just helping people live good lives as polymaths, because I think that is a natural, normal human tendency. And I know that was one of the questions. Um, the thing is, I promote it because it's a good way for, for humanity to encourage creativity and innovation um, and to just make, build bridges, synthesize information, uh, you know, see the bigger picture. If we're all so narrowly focused and specialized, who's going to, you know, see the, see the forest if we're all just looking at the trees. So we do need thinkers that are, 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 are looking up and out, not just down. I'm curious for you, Michael. So those are some of the reasons I promote polymathy. For you, why do you promote polymathy and what do you wish for it in the future? Well, well first of all, I'm a polymath. I mean, I can either promote what I am or, or remain sort of an obscurity. So that's certainly one reason. But another reason, if you've read uh, my article, The Inappropriately Excluded, there I talk a lot about, you get people like uh, William Sidus, uh, one of the most intellectually spectacular people in all of history. And he spent his life uh, uh, handing out theater tickets in a, in, a, in a booth. And he did that because it gave him the freedom to think about stuff and to write about stuff and all that kind of stuff. So when you do that to people, when you marginalize exceptional people, you are not hurting just that person. You're hurting all of society. Yeah, absolutely. And Michael, you mentioned your blog. Can you let people know where they can find it? Yeah, it's michaelwferguson.blogspot.com. Um, Perfect. All right. Although if you look up inappropriately excluded, you'll be directed right to it. It's number one on Google. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Yeah, I encourage you guys to check that out. Okay, let's go to number six, which is that polymaths value being brave, being courageous. To, cause to some extent, in this age of specialization, if you choose to live as a polymath, you're kind of, you know, breaking outside society's box for you. 
So what, what that means also, one of the things I heard from my participants is that being a polymath in an age that cherishes specialization and that where the larger narrative is specialized, if you don't do that, and also because this is not something that tends to be spoken about a lot, is that it can feel very lonely. It can feel like a singular exploration into your loneliness, but it can also just feel uh, alone, like, because we don't talk about it and there's no community. And by the way, that's why, that's why I'm sure Michael Ferguson and I both started our Facebook groups is to create sort of awareness and discourse and a place for polymaths to go and connect. Um, but if, you know, if that's the environment they're in, obviously it does require some bravery. And uh, so that's something that they value. And let's see what else. Diana, here's a quote. I'll share another quote. Diana said, you as a polymath have the courage to say yes to so many more things because they're either interesting to you or you make yourself open to the possibility of them existing or, or even happening. The benefit is you get to experience a lot of cool things if you have the courage to step up and say yes, right, or I want to. Michael, does this resonate with you? Um, and how, how has being brave or courageous played into how you've lived your life as a polymath? Well, first of all, I would disagree with the last part just simply because, and it may be true for her, but it's not true for me. I had no choice in the matter. I look at it sort of as a person who says I'm gay. Uh, that wasn't a decision. It took no courage to be gay. It's just what they were. Mm -hmm. But it takes courage to get out there and say, hey, everybody, I'm gay. That takes mm -hmm. courage because yeah. you're running the risk of getting negative feedback. And that's sort of where I was as a polymath. There was no courage in being a polymath. I, didn't, I never was not. Um, the courage lay in when I decided I am willing to sort of turn my life upside down in order to um, manifest polymathy more completely within my life. Then I got a lot of disapproval from family, friends, everybody. Mm. And yeah, that takes courage. Yeah, absolutely. It takes courage just to say I'm a polymath because a lot of people hide and censor that about themselves. That's what I heard from my participants because it can be construed as boasting or bragging or exaggerating. And so even kind of the storytelling around your identity as a polymath can be a challenge. So it requires bravery and courage to, you know, show I gotta, who you I gotta, are. I got to tell you, I got to tell you that I've just stopped talking about that unless I'm dealing with somebody who I think is a polymath. And the reason is because it has no positive result. And as people ask me, what do you do? I said, well, I write articles, I write books. And uh, they say, well, about what? I say, about all sorts of things. And so I just sort of dance around the polymathic aspect of it and just talk, I'm, I'm a writer. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good coping mechanism, Michael. <laughs> all right, let's go on to number seven. Another value that polymaths uh, express is honesty, integrity, authenticity. They don't want to be fake. They don't want to live someone else's life. You know, society may write a script for how you, you should live your life. But these are people who don't, they break outside of the box. And by the way, that analogy came up a lot with the participants I interviewed. So being true to your nature, first identifying it and having awareness of like how you like to learn, how you like to live, and then being honest with yourself about it and, and living your life in an authentic way. Here's a quote from a, a book um, by Eric Fromm. The book's called The Sane Society. And in 1955, Eric Fromm said, the whole life, of the individual is nothing but the process of giving birth to himself. Arguably this, uh, and, end quote. So this giving birth process obviously should take place through exposure. Like how are you supposed to give birth to yourself, you know, if you don't figure out what you like? So exposure, being open to experiences is really critical in, or, in order to sort of curate your experience and, and, and self-author your own life. And it takes some trial and error. Kolb in 2015 has argued that experience and exposure plays a central role in learning. And polymaths are, are lifelong learners who get exposure across various domains. So someone with polymathic tendencies, the idea of focusing in one single area feels like an impossibility, so uncomfortable, just not even an option. So Michael, there's a lot of pressure in our society to specialize. So what would you say to someone, to, to a polymath who's feeling that pressure to specialize narrowly, but who knows deep down that they prefer to have broad learning and experiences? 
Well, as I said before, they're in a bind and, and they have to decide which is more important to them. Uh, at one point in my career, I was a director of financial planning and analysis for a very large company. And uh, I said to my wife at that time, I said, you know, I am having a wonderful life. Everybody would consider this to be a successful life, but it isn't my life. And I think a lot of polymaths feel that even if they say, okay, fine, I'm going to make that sacrifice uh, to do this stuff because I want to have family, friends, uh, house, all that kind of stuff. Uh, at some point in time, they'll recognize that there's sort of a they're sort of fake, but you're not given a good alter alternative, and and we should. But that's our job. We need to be the ones who go out and say we're going to make polymathy a polymath as a profession. We're going to go out and sell it, uh, and and uh, give ourselves better options. I mean, we're fools if we think we're going to get somebody else who's just going to walk in and say, hey, we got to solve this problem for polymaths. They won't. Mm -hmm. Someone just asked in the comments, how often does the speaker or, an, or any guest come across the combination of polymathic brain and polymathy and human relationships, i.e. polyamory? So this is an interesting question. I just want to address this real quick. So I have, you know, people contact me from all over the world about my research. And I have had polyamorous people who this is sort of the closest approximation uh, that they have found about, about being polyamorous. And I've also a number of uh, people I interviewed, I didn't ask about sexual orientation, but a number, uh, uh, several of the women I interviewed told me that they're bisexual and they, they just brought that out on their own. So I guess, you know, if you're very open to experiences, if you're at the far end of that spectrum, it may show up in, in polyamory. Absolutely. Excellent. Exactly. If you're open to experiences, you're going to get to some odd experiences offered to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, as far as that, because the research is pretty strong. Uh, there's a there's a high um, potential for women to be bisexual. So that isn't really a surprise. You make it something that's sort of like the in thing to be, and, and you're going to get a lot of women being that way. If you try to do that to men, it'll do no good. They say men are like a light switch. You can't really change them much. Interesting. All right, let's go on to number eight, value number eight, the last one we're going to be talking about today before we transition into Q&A. And that is obviously polymath's value, self-improvement, self-actualization, even or, you know, developing their, the, their skills and their knowledge. They want to be the best that they can be. And, and that's why a lot of them do all the learning and all the experiences, because they want to live a rich life and reach their potential. And I'm actually going to read a quote from Michael Ferguson's blog on this. And then, Michael, I, I'll give you a chance to respond and I'll, I'll ask you a question as well. So here is an excerpt from A Finely Crafted Life by Michael Ferguson. An explosive growth in robotics and artificial intelligence is about to result in massive technological unemployment, followed by an income explosion. This will drive the whole population up Maslow's hierarchy. Rather than being concerned with food, shelter, water, sleep, safety, and security, people trusting in their abundance will become more occupied with matters of achievement, education, respect, self-actualization, and transcendence. In other words, rather than just surviving, people will come to think of their life as a form of performance art. I love that. Expressing their unique manifestation of human potential. So Michael, can you comment on that? What do you think makes a finely crafted life? Just anything else you wanna say on that at the end of the day? What are the critical ingredients in your mind to living life well? Yeah, I got to be a pretty decent writer. I was really bad when I started. <laughs> um, uh, I wrote a very, very long article on um, the finely crafted life. And at some point I realized that this is a book sized idea. This isn't an a article size idea. So I took it down, uh, put it in a file where I'm going to elaborate it into a book and put something briefer in there that sort of gave, gives you a flavor of what I'm talking about. But I believe that a finely crafted life is it's, it's a process that a person goes through that is, to a certain extent is um, analytical, uh, ordered, organized. It's not just something that, that happens. You sit down and you say, okay, fine, there are certain certain things I want to experience in life. And I look at all the ways that I, I experience life and say, do, do the things that I'm doing fulfill the needs that I want? 
you know, I got I got needs in in learning. I got needs in in love. I got needs in uh, uh, professions, productive. And you know, I got all these needs, and I want to get enough, but not too much of each one of them. And so you got to or you got to create a life that allows you to do that. If you do it properly, when you get done down to the bottom of it, you're going to get 100% in everything. You're not going to get 80%. You're not going to get 120%. You're going to be 100% in everything. And that is a very finely crafted life. Yeah, I remember reading that longer version and I loved it, Michael. So I'm glad, hey. to, hear, yeah, I'm glad to hear that you're going to be posting it or, or including it in your book. All right, so those are the same, the eight kind of value sets that polymaths tend to value. And I just want to kind of explain why why I'm even talking about values and sort of the ethos of a polymath is there's a if you identify as a polymathic person there can be real value in in sort of rank ordering like literally knowing what are your top values and I've mentioned eight of them today maybe some of them resonate with you but if you ever have a fork in the road a decision to make uh just any, any sort of way that you want to live out your life, it can be very powerful to know, well, what do you value? What are your core values? And I just want to share, um, there are actually these values cards. This oh, is I how like I, that. yeah, values, <laughs> like it's a whole deck of cards and I'll share some, you know, like variety, open-mindedness, intelligence, innovation, you know, so, so one of the exercises, um, that I encourage you to do. And, you know, if you can get a deck of values cards, great. If not, you can even make an Excel sheet or probably Google a list of values and, and just rank order them yourself. But if you can identify the top like five or 10 values that you have, and maybe there's some, you know, overlap with the values that polymaths have, it can be really powerful. Cause when you have, again, some, some fork in the road, some challenge ahead of you, if you know, well, my top value is integrity or if my top value is, let's see, uh, growth, then that can help inform how you navigate that challenge or that decision. So that's part of why I wanted to talk about the values of polymaths, because I, I would imagine that, that many of you here identify as being polymathic people. And, um, you know, to figure out what, you, what your values are. I shared eight of them today, based on, you know, my, my knowledge of what polymaths tend to value. Um, so hopefully that's a helpful tip for you guys. And now we can shift into some Q and A. Shrikant, do you want to cover the rules yes. and get us started? I, I, I do want to say one thing before sure. we leave this part, and yeah. that is is that your last point was really a good one. Uh, polymaths do uh, find themselves being informed to values in a different way than the rest of the population. And I've said this from the beginning. If we build effective polymathic communities, they will be culturally different than the mainstream. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The mainstream may value conformity or expert deep expertise, or you know, there's a different narrative that that you know the values associated with specialization would probably be different than the values associated with polymathy. So if you want to live your life in a polymathic way, it's really important to understand what you value and live your life according to those values. All right, folks. So now oh. it's time for Q&A. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do Q&A, uh, then we're going to do breakout rooms, and then we're going to come back. Actually, I have questions for uh, Michael. I'm just fascinated by what he has said, but I will hold all my questions uh, for, the, for the takeaway section. All right, so uh, so questions. So it's going to be Reina, Donna, Laura, Martin, and David next. Uh, folks, we have four rules for questions. In order to ask questions, go ahead and type by exclamation mark in, uh, in chat or raise your hand in Zoom. That's rule number one. Rule number two, keep on topic. Rule number three, be brief. Just brief questions, no comments at this stage. You will have time to do that during your takeaway section. And number four, speak your mind. Feel free to disagree with anything anybody has said and do so courteously. All right, with that, it's going to be Rena first. Uh, give me just a second. Okay, I need to set something up here. Yes, uh, Rena, go ahead. I think, I don't know if Rena is able to speak, but I see her question was, can okay. you read the eight values again from your outline? So I'll just, yes, that's a great idea just to resummarize. Um, so number one is, 
information, learning, intelligence, curiosity, you know, information too. Openness, open-mindedness, openness to experience, but also combined with some critical thinking, independent thinking. So being open, but sort of selective as well. Uh, number three, independence, originality, freedom, autonomy, sort of that ethos of, you know, being your own person, paving your own way. Four, variety, change, and newness. Five is innovation and creativity. Six is courage or bravery. Seven was honesty, integrity, authenticity, sort of breaking outside the box and being true to your nature. And eight was self-development, self-improvement, self-actualization. So the, those are the core values, I think, based on my research that polymath value or cherish. Excellent. Next question is from Donna. Uh, Donna, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, or I'll ask you for you. Donna, go ahead. Is it human nature to be a polymath, but culture discourages nature? In my opinion, absolutely. I think it is in our human nature to be polymathic. I think in the Industrial Revolution and the Victorian era, or you know, just as information exploded, we, for the sake of efficiency, chopped up you know, what each person knows, and we decided to know more and more about less and less individually. Uh, and it, it was efficient, and in some ways it, it helped us, but I think we're in a shift where we're seeing the downsides of that, and also because of technology sort of helping us manage information in this information age. Um, I think we're seeing a shift just even personally with people wanting to live well, and and part of living well for a lot of people means having the full human experience and not being so narrow that you feel like a cog in a, a machine. Um, so yes, I think it is the natural way of being. I just think the the narrative we're in right now tells us something very different, which is not a natural in my opinion. Michael Ferguson, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think this is the natural way of being? Well, you know, all I have to do is look at little kids. Uh, they ask why, why, why? And it's not like I ask why, why, why about trees or it's about everything. Uh, so people obviously start out that way. The question is, is that as they truncate their interests and their focus, as they get older, how much of that is sociological and how much of that is just simply the maturation problem of humans? And I don't think we have a good answer for that. But we certainly could encourage it rather than discourage it, which is what we're doing. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, next up is Laura, Martin, David, Stefan, uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen, and Sally. Laura, go ahead. What's your question? Laura, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. So let's say you have reached, a, you know, you're an expert in something and you want to do something with that. And so in order to do that, you have to sort of go back to being, um, go back to be, uh, I can't get the word out, um, constituent. Um, you, you sort of drop into that arena because you want to gather new information because you're going to do that with a certain population, uh, some work. So you, you go back into that world, you gather lots of information, and then you go you utilize your expertise in that and create something new. Within that, you're going to have to deal with um, lots of, of your other things. You know, you're going to have to bang your head against the wall because people aren't going to want you to do it. They're not interested in change. You're going to have to affect change. So you're going to have to learn how to negotiate that. Um, you know, the other people aren't interested in change for other reasons. So you have to have a different kind of negotiation skill to get that implemented. And so it's a whole process of taking your expertise, but taking it down to a functional level and then gathering all that up and then taking this object and executing it and seeing how it works and then evaluating and so on. So, and that being an iterative process. Now I have that for one thing and then I'm gonna do something else with another group and I'm gonna have to do the same thing, basically take myself down into that because I have this I wanna do with the group and so on. Okay. So, okay, so. Uh, no, that's, that's great. I, I think that's a very good formulation of the process that uh, 
a polymath would have to go to. So, um, Michael, does this resonate with you? Not in the slightest. Uh, and, and this is something that uh, a lot of the polymaths, they, polymaths I talk to also echo. And that is, is that the process of becoming expert in something is so simple for them and so natural that their real problem is, is it's too easy. It doesn't represent any kind of impediment to just simply dropping your career and going into something else. Wow, excellent. Uh, next up is Martin, David, Stephen, Sally, uh, Tova, and Barry. Uh, folks, please keep your questions very brief so we can get to as many questions as we possibly can. Martin, go ahead. Hey, hi, everybody. I, I'm gonna try to make that very simple, but. It's a little bit difficult, the question, I think. Uh, Michael, I want to ask you, uh, let's say from my point of view, it's very difficult to have uh, tools to when you need to change your cosmogony or your uh, thinking system. How, you, how do you deal when you have a situation or information or evidence that change all the whole cosmogony that you have and, and that is a huge impact to your head and to your mind and to your everything. How, if you have some elements or tools or let's say implementation that you use when you have that situation that you find that, let's say serendipity or epiphany, let's, let's say that change with the information, the new information that you have that change all the, the aspect of your thinking system. If you have some elements that you use to absorb that information better. Uh, I, I got to say that I don't think that ever happened to me. Um, <clears throat> I have a saying that uh, ideology makes you stupid. There's a whole lot of people that construct uh, worldviews that are just uh, rife with opportunities for cognitive dissonance. And they're constantly be being brought up against evidence that ought to just simply shatter how they look at things. If you are putting effort, intention into being objective, and that is a separate thing than being erudite or intelligent. You have to say, I'm gonna be objective. If, if, if this conclusion feels comfortable to me, I had to start doubting it. Um, and if you do that, you don't ever build a worldview that is so at odds with the evidence that you're gonna have that kind of crisis. Excellent. Uh, next up is uh, David. David, go ahead. Hi, thanks very much, Grant and Gregory for hosting this. I was wondering if Angela and, and Michael could comment on the possibility of a relationship between polymaths and autism spectrum, especially the high functioning uh, autism, because some of the things that Angela mentioned in her characteristics, other than the special, I mean, which wasn't specialization, which is a characteristic of autism, but this could be sort of an opposite um, pull but similarity to autism in terms of you know, the honesty, the information, intelligence, there are many aspects of high functioning polymaths. So I was wondering about that and if there's a, a thought of a physiological basis for polymath. Mm. Angela, me or you? You can go for it, go for it. Okay, um, <clears throat> first of all, it's about being on this spectrum uh, yeah, I've, I've known a lot of polymaths that were on that, uh, and I, I, I'm getting to know them well. My feeling is kind of that, uh, not to say that, um, that uh, being autistic is a, or, or having um, uh, that, that, that spectrum is a choice. I'm not saying that it is, but it's very easy for them to sort of avoid the repercussions of being on the spectrum by saying, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, uh, immerse myself in learning. And that way I don't have to deal with all these confusing people. Uh, and I do have a couple of friends who are on the spectrum and I get a sense that that's what they do. Okay, uh, next up is uh, Steven, Sally, Towa and Barry. Uh, Steven, go ahead. Hello, uh, you can hear me? Yes. Great. So uh, first I'd like to say that it, it has certainly not been a choice. <laughs> so I'm, I'm with the not choice camp. And the second one is uh, the actual question is how do you deal with people who really are obsessed with uh, labeling you as a jack of all trades, you know, especially since uh, specialists have to identify themselves 
and and in my case, uh, you know, I teach at Berkeley, so I have a lot of PhDs, double, triple PhDs, who want to <laughs> advocate that singularity of knowledge. And and when they run across uh, my skill set or a polymath in general, they they tend to want to label you with that uh, question, that jack of all trades. So how would you uh, deal with that? Michael, do you have any thoughts on this? Oh, I certainly do. Go for uh, it. Because because I've I've uh, I've approached acad uh, the academy on a number of occasions trying to proselytize for polymathy, and the pushback has just been astonishing. I remember one professor at, I think it was at USC, he was an anthropology professor. And it was like, no matter what I brought up as an example of a polymathic question, he managed to jam it into one subject or another. And I just realized that at one point, this guy is just not open to the whole issue. So it doesn't make any sense to continue uh, with the discussion. And it's amazing how much I just don't engage. I just say, well, maybe you're right. I don't think they are, but I say that because I don't see anything productive happening in engaging them. One thought is too, is that you could, you know, you could use the word polymath and explain what a polymath is and explain that you identify Stephen as a polymathic kind of guy and begin a discussion around that, redirect away from the jacks of all trades label, if that's one you don't like. I don't particularly like it. You know, I would love for more people to use the word polymath. <laughs> Most people don't know the word. So uh, that's one thought. Next up is Sally. Sally, go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to make sure um, Raina's question was answered um, about uh, the polymathic brain and um, any relationship to overthinking, procrastination, narcissism. And then she adds, um, in, uh, especially in regards to working in groups and teams. My questions are questions. Good question. Okay. Overthinking, absolutely. <laughs> I think that would be associated with polymathy. I heard that from my participants, just kind of like the always, always thinking, a uh, discomfort even with sort of relaxation sometimes, depending on the polymath. So overthinking, yes. Procrastination, it depends on the polymath, I would say. Narcissism. I don't think. Oh, go ahead, Michael. Oh, I don't think that's really the best way to explain it, although it comes off to most people as being procrastination. The fact is, is that if I start a project and I think it's going to take like four or five months, it's just impossible for me not to get attracted to something else that wanders along. <laughs> so my life was really disorganized until about, I'd say, my mid-20s when I realized that's okay. I just set it aside and put it on my to-do list. It was number one, but now it's not. Now it's number seven, and I work on this other thing, and I'll get back to it. And so you need to do that. If you just keep bouncing around from one thing to another, you'll never complete anything. But that's not procrastination. That's just it. That's being overly curious. Yeah. Even Leonardo da Vinci himself, like he would, he would sometimes start projects and bad at it, and they stay undone for quite some time. So if you want to call that procrastination, okay, but keep in mind, he was producing in lots of other areas. Maybe he set something aside. You know, you have to prioritize how you spend your time and what you work on. Um, Next up is Tova. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, whether or not you think there is um, a direct or indirect like purpose or reason to like lessen children's interest in asking questions within the American school system? Um, I want to give a shout out for self-directed learning here. Um, and I, I wish that the school system was more designed around supporting a child's own curiosity. Like, and there are, there are some schools in the United States that exist like this. There are few and far between, but where a teacher is seen more as a guide, where the child identifies something one, they wanna learn about and the teacher sort of helps them find information and supports them on their learning journey. But most of, of the American educational system, uh, even, even up through college is sort of what, what an author, who was it? I'm not gonna remember his name, he called it banking education where you where the school system makes a deposit like let me just click link deposit information into you and it doesn't matter if you want it or not um 
I don't know if that answers your question, Tova, but I, I, what I would like to see happen more in the educational system is that people have more volition and agency and voice in picking what they want to learn about rather than it just being sort of dictated. I mean, I guess there's some value in giving people like a basic, you know, groundwork um, of things that, that everybody should know. Okay, so maybe there's some of that that is important. But at the end of the day, if you force people to learn stuff they're not interested in, they're probably just going to forget it anyway. So how, I guess, I think part of the question is, is how can we support people learning about what they really want to learn about, even children. Okay. Uh, uh, let me go ahead. Can I can I say something about that? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Uh, I I felt when I was in in school, uh, the way I describe it is is I feel like the educational system was trying to force me through a funnel, uh, where I went in and it's like I was this broad sort of. Uh, territory to explore, but as I went farther and farther into education, they kept truncating what I could look at, what they considered important until finally at the end, I felt like uh, I was just being squeezed. Um, but I think that's a characteristic of polymath and to a certain extent high IQ people, um, that they just don't take well to instruction. I, I think if you got most people, I'd say probably 85% of the people they go to school, they get it instructed, and that's fit, that fits how their life is going to go. Yeah, there is a certain kind of rebelliousness and contrarianism, or maybe you could just call it critical thinking. But the, and maybe instead of rebelliousness, you'd just call it bravery or courage. But there is this sort of ethos and vibe and value that a polymath is going to, you know, if they don't agree with something, if they don't want something, they're they're going to resist even in, in a learning environment. So that even underscores even more why for this type of person, it's important to let them have some agency in their own learning journey. Wonderful. Uh, now we're going to take one last question from Barry and then we're going to go to breakout rooms uh, after which we're going to come back and do the takeaways. Uh, so Barry, your answer. Okay, I'm going to have to uh, let, give you a kind of a forewarning. I am really super excited about being involved with you guys. This is like when I retired 20 years ago. I have I woke up this morning with the same kind of feeling. It's like I'm going on a new adventure, and uh, but it's not going someplace. It's internal, and uh, because I have so I have experienced so much negativity towards my polymathy. And especially when I lost my wife, and that's the question, is how do you deal with family and friends when you need them the most, when you're grieving because you've lost your wife of 50 years, and the only and the thing that you resort to is your polymathy to support yourself emotionally, and your children turn against you and reject you. That's what I've experienced. The very time I need them the most, they hurt me rather than help me because of my uh, turning to, and I went to a counselor and he encouraged me to paint, to write poetry and to play the piano and, and be close to nature and to write and all those things that I've, uh, I've been involved in just a smattering. And I, but I was able to contain them like a test, like in a, uh, toothpaste tube and then when my wife died the tube was no longer could contain me it just squirted out and so I how do you deal with that hard Early. <laughs> yeah Barry it's good to see you I how do you how do you deal with you know people's judgments of your doing things that are good for you that bring that are life affirming and and energize you and excite you to be, you know, to be alive and enjoy your human experience, painting and poetry and nature and writing. Like, I don't, I, it boggles my mind that someone would judge those things as negative, especially for, for a retired guy that they care about. So how do you, I mean, this is, this is a, a real challenge polymath face more generally is the storytelling around your identity and your passions. How do you articulate it in a way so that people understand, support, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, even if you don't get their support, you've got to find a place in you that is okay with it. 
uh, with caring less about what other people think because it's your life. And that's I something I would mention to any polymath. Try not to care so much about what other people think and write your own story. I had the same experience with my children. And uh, the only thing I can say is, is that uh, at some point you just gotta say, uh, they have my best interests at heart. They just don't understand me. But what they think they're doing the right thing. Um, wonderful. Um, so Barry, I have to say, firstly, we are equally excited to have you join us. Uh, it's just wonderful to see your enthusiasm. Um, second thing I would say, the point that you made when we had this discussion last time, that being polymath is actually a requirement for your soul. You know, that's who you are as a person. Now, what happens uh, in terms of career, what happens with your social relations, that comes afterwards. How do you negotiate with that? That comes afterwards. Kind of being true to yourself, if you don't do that, that's going to kill you inside. I mean, Amen. problems of actually dealing with other people, no matter how negative, that is a minor thing as compared to, compared to losing what you have inside. It's like a kid, you know, a kid needs to be curious. They need to play, they need to move, they need to explore. If you make the kid sit on a chair all day long, that is profound and just listen and be told what to do. That is profoundly against the nature of a kid. And it's a similar thing that, you know, you have to protect yourself uh, in doing that. So uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, next up, we are going to do uh, breakout rooms and we are going to come back to share our takeaways. Uh, folks, please let everybody in the breakout rooms have two minutes to have their say about what they think is the ethos of polymath. And then you can have a discussion and then we, we come back here to share our takeaways. I'm starting- Can, the can I add something real quick, Shrikant too? Yes. I'd like you, to, you guys to share about like, well, what are your core values and how does that show up in your life? And do you identify as a polymath? Like did the values we talked about today resonate with you or are they ones that you prioritize and how you live out your life? Or if not, what are, what are your other core values? Wonderful. So, 